Welcome to LSE IQ, a podcast from the London School of Economics and Political Science, where we ask leading social scientists and other experts to answer an intelligent question about economics, politics or society. Over the last couple of decades, Western aid agencies, the World Bank, NGOs and business schools have all enthusiastically embraced the concept of social entrepreneurship. This takes the methods and energy of business entrepreneurship and applies them to often intractable social or environmental problems. Social enterprises hold the promise of developing financially sustainable solutions and of providing dignity, rather than just charity, for those they seek to help. In this episode of LSE IQ, Sue Windybank asks, could social entrepreneurship be the answer to world poverty? Growing up on the Cape Flats, um, I was exposed to people using drugs and, and also like a lot of gang violence. And by seeing, by seeing that all the time, I thought that is what I should eventually become. I thought it, I thought it was the right thing, I thought it was normal. And eventually after, after a while, I started experimenting with, with drugs. After being on, on drugs for a few years, um, I then eventually started, start, um, started selling. This is the voice of Brent Williams, an ex-drug dealer and former meth addict from the Cape Flats a community in Cape Town, South Africa, beset by serious social problems, including poverty, high unemployment and gangs. One day, while high on drugs, Brent decided he would make a name for himself by killing his parents. He took a kitchen knife and although he held the blade in front of his mother's face, something stopped him from hurting her. He still went on to hold his parents hostage for four hours until the police arrived And this wasn't the turning point in Brent's life. That came later, when sick of binging on drugs, he decided to look for help. Something which proved challenging in the flats, until he met a man named Marlon Parker. I was introduced to Marlon Parker. He's the founder member of of R Labs. Uh, Marlon introduced us to technology, and that is when I found a new addiction. I really became, I spent a lot of time online, and I then discovered that through technology we could like you know we could actually reach out to to so many people out there through through sharing our stories of hope and we then developed an, an application a, a mobile counseling um, application people could now access advice um, through through their mobile phones irrespective of where they found themselves for me when I was in this room like using drugs that would have been the perfect platform for me to express myself and and to seek advice so irrespective if people are now in a drug house where they're walking down the streets or wherever it could be at work, if they needed advice and support, that is where um, our, our, our application is where they could then find and seek this advice. The app was shared at a local school and then it went viral. To date, it has been used to counsel over 4 million people. Brent now works at R Labs, which has developed into a social enterprise training young people from the community in technology and entrepreneurship. These young people, some of whom have been drug dealers, gangsters and prostitutes, are encouraged to become pioneers and change makers by turning problems facing their own community into opportunities. The best ideas are developed through the R-Labs Innovation Incubator, turning them into apps and income generating products. A 2015 study by McKinsey estimated that our labs have been responsible for generating $22 million of value for the Western Cape region. Dr Christian Bush is a researcher in the Innovation Co-Creation Lab at LSE. The lab focuses on how poverty and related issues can be alleviated through innovative business models. He tells me why he finds our labs particularly inspiring. And so... What they did was they developed a education methodology of, you know, these are the 10 steps to learn social media. These are then the 10 steps to set up a business around it and so on. And so first they set up a training academy, then an incubator, which essentially helped people develop their businesses and essentially get funding for it. And now they scaled into 22 countries with a very simple approach where they go into a local community, They look at what is already here. Oh, there's a local hospice where there's one room free. Oh, there are a couple of people who are local community leaders. Hey, here's a simple methodology of how you can now see whatever is here and turn this into something where you have a simple training academy where a former drug dealer can teach someone, their parents, their kids, their grandparents, their neighbors, where this feeling of dignity and hope and this feeling of for the first time in 
you know, in I mean, I talked with someone last week. We've been do, working with them since the last seven years. And what he said again was this idea of, hey, this was the first time in my life where I felt I did something that actually was deeply, deeply, deeply matter, like that mattered to me. And so I think this feeling of dignity, this feeling of, hey, we're actually here, we, we mean something. And our labs has been extremely good at instilling this into tens of thousands of people who are not only now learning about this education methodology, but who also then become teachers themselves. Perhaps this is the moment to take a step back and try and define what social enterprises and social entrepreneurship are, because it's a hotly contested and polarising debate. Stefan Chambers, director of the Marshall Institute for Philanthropy and Social Entrepreneurship, which is based at LSE, gives the definition he prefers. I think that um, we should start with some kind of idea about what we think entrepreneurship is. And I think entrepreneurship is about um, getting stuff done without owning or controlling the means to get those things done. You can start a whole organization without having any staff, any clients, any customers, any IP, any cash, any buildings, any supply chain. You can start it with conviction and an idea and a set of networks. If you add to that um, the social dimension, what you get is entrepreneurship that has an absolutely explicit and intentional aim to create social benefit. Not simply the absence of social harm, not simply the absence of unintended negative consequences, but uh, ventures whose entire purpose is committed to creating a better equilibrium um, in, in respect of the social return on that activity. So that would be my preference. But what you'll find when you talk to people in this world is you get a kind of spectrum. On the one hand, you get people who think that social entrepreneurship is essentially market capitalism, but a bit more responsible. And the positive effects of that um, disperse themselves or trickle down or are distributed such that everyone is better off. You might call that the kind of shareholder view of social entrepreneurship. On the other end of the spectrum, you have um, um, activists who identify as social entrepreneurs who don't believe in markets. They don't believe in competition. They don't believe in capital. They believe in changing consciousness by doing interesting and creative things. So the term entrepreneur has been adopted by a broad group of people working on poverty and social justice issues. The most commonly understood definition of social enterprise, and the one I'm going to focus on, relates to organisations with a business or trading vehicle. Dr Julie Wong, who used to work in LSE's Department of Anthropology and is now based at the University of Edinburgh, explains. So, for instance, some social enterprises might have completely separate um, entities, even legally separate entities, one of which produces profit that then gets ploughed into a separate charitable project. So charity shops, um, the British Heart Foundation, for instance, that sell clothing to people and then use that those funds to for research or for other social goals. Um, other social enterprises um, have a um, have a setup where the economic and the social elements are tied in together, like microfinance, for instance. So lending small amounts of money to women to develop enterprising projects um, is what generates the revenue for the organization and also in enables women to, in theory, um, build a livelihood for themselves. But those types of social enterprises often face uh, internal tensions. So sometimes to increase the profit diminishes the social returns, or if you focus more on the social returns, then that limits the ability of the enterprise to be self-sustaining financially itself. So that's a big issue within many social enterprises. Um, the best ones ideally would have a hand-in-hand a -hand type of relationship between the social and the commercial aspects, where the more you are making profits, the more the social impact that gets generated. Um, for instance, in a cooperative where the the members are also the shareholders, and it's a internally self um, a generous, a virtuous cycle. So um, a lot of people would try to say one of these is a social enterprise and, and, and others aren't. Um, but I think we can speak broadly about uh, any organizational configuration that 
tries to use a certain array of market mechanisms in order to solve a social problem. Making money while doing good is appealing to many would-be social entrepreneurs. And who wouldn't want to combine helping eradicate poverty with the dynamism of entrepreneurship? Here's Stefan Chambers again, tackling a popular preconception. When people talk about social entrepreneurship, and indeed when they talk about entrepreneurship, usually without being conscious that this is what they're doing, their, model, their mental model is that of technology. And their mental model is Mark Zuckerberg, let's pretend, just to, to stereotype a, uh, a, an individual. They're talking about a Silicon Valley model that is global, ambitious, platform-based, and disruptive. And they live with slogans like move fast and break things, and they are um, absolutely committed to a kind of Schumpeterian ideology of disruption. And I understand why that stuff is interesting and important. And I certainly understand why it's seductive in the popular imagination, not least because we live with these devices and networks, and we have created a, um, a kind of mythic class of heroes from Silicon Valley. But it is not the whole story. It's not the whole story in entrepreneurship. The vast majority of commercial entrepreneurial activity has nothing to do with platforms, nothing to do with technology, isn't scalable, isn't besotted by this fetish for um, uh, moving fast and breaking things. Um, and I think we need to be quite careful in the social enterprise world not to be unduly seduced by the Silicon Valley model. I wonder if it was called something else, whether it would be so seductive, but it's, it's the connection. Yeah, if it was, yes. I mean, if it was called supply chain innovation, it would probably go down less well. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it's not just ambitious individuals who are interested in social enterprise. Governments, NGOs and other major players in development, such as the World Bank, have all been promoting market-driven development. Why have these organisations come to see social enterprise as an effective way to tackle poverty and other serious social issues? And given that the concept isn't entirely new, why has it come into focus over the last couple of decades or so? Julie Wang explains. Uh, for a number of reasons. I think because one is that decades of aid sent from developed countries to so-called underdeveloped countries has not had the results that were hoped for and in many cases entrenched um, relations of dependence and so there are a lot of frustrations with the traditional charitable models and then on the other side with the the recent financial crash people have been questioning unscrupulous business practices and the um, the intense pursuit of solely profit um, and so it's quite compelling for a number of people who want to find alternatives in a way to make business a bit more human and also make uh, development practices a bit more self-sustaining. So it, it's very compelling for especially Western audiences. Christian Bush explains that one of the key attractions and strengths of the entrepreneurial approach is that social entrepreneurs often work with the resources that already exist in a community. Well, I mean, at the core of entrepreneurship, at least in, in our work and, and working with the entrepreneurs we work with, is this idea of how do you make the best out of whatever is there? And so essentially you don't look at, oh, what is the budget and then trying to somehow, you know, spend that on whatever problem there is. But it's about going into a context and saying, what is happening here? It's not about saying, what are you lacking? It's about saying, where is there an opportunity where we can co-create something that actually can help people live better lives? And so what I find intriguing, a lot of my work is in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And a lot of people I talk with, they feel... Uh, that development organizations, particularly, you know, Western governments and, and their, their organizations over the last years have quite focused on this idea of uh, lack of resources. So they would go to someone and say, what do you need? And essentially what a lot of people then would feel is it puts them into the role of a victim because it's essentially someone who receives something. But what they would love to do, a lot of the, the people we, would, uh, we work with, is to say, we would love to work with you to create these resources in the first place. And so what entrepreneurs do is they join forces with local community leaders, uh, with, with local people to say, okay, if we don't have financial resources here, 
all right, but we have local resourcefulness, we have local social capital. We have so many aspects that if you just come in from a macro perspective of a government, you might not necessarily see, but rather kind of this bottom up idea of what is already here. And then it's great if government comes in at a certain stage to help out and to essentially co-create and to co-finance, wonderful. But if we just focus on governments being the ones who are responsible for helping people out, we develop a handout mentality that is absolutely opposed to the beautiful resourcefulness that we see particularly in those sub-Saharan contexts. Stefan Chambers describes another persuasive argument in favour of the approach. Innovative social entrepreneurs working on a relatively small scale can signal what's possible to both governments and business. So really great social entrepreneurs find an unjust circumstance address it at a system level, demonstrate that that, that, that addressing has uh, the ability to be sustained and developed, and then partner with other institutions, state institutions, private institutions, individuals, to scale that up. So at the risk of sounding too, making too grand a claim, I think what social entrepreneurship really is is not a is not a, a an economic hybrid, but a but a kind of revolution in consciousness. It's a revolution in creating a, 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 a something out of this antagonism between states and markets. Gyanshala in India is one example of how social enterprises can be successfully scaled up by government. The NGO aims to help children from poor families to achieve learning levels similar to those achieved by children in elite schools. Its founder, Professor Pankaj Jain, recognised the importance of excellent teachers and also that there was not enough of them in India. One of his innovations was to rethink the role of the teacher. He broke down some of the complex parts of the role into simple routines and standardised tasks and then trained local women with strong interpersonal skills to do them. Julie Wang explains how the Indian government took up some of the project's innovations. Uh, well, there's a, um, an education social enterprise in India called Gyanshala that, works, uh, that started out in, in Ahmedabad. And they built an innovative um, educational model for low-income families that I would not say should then be scaled up and have affordable private schools be the only educational offerings for kids. Um, but, but what also happened and, and what I think was quite useful was that they, their particular innovations that they made in their educational process, they then upsold to the government. Um, and so then the government is able to introduce these innovations to the, the free public schools to increase the quality of the national system that's freely available to all children. And so uh, a good place for social enterprise is to build these innovations that then can be spread across public infrastructures for the public good. So it's an opportunity to experiment. Yes. In a, it's, a, it's an opportunity to experiment in a way that governments often can't do. States are not often very agile to change the way that they do things or to try something out this year and something else out the next year but small enterprises can. Dr. Jason Hickel from LSE's Department of Anthropology is cynical about why the social enterprise approach has been so compelling. He is critical of perhaps the best known example of social enterprise, microfinance. This was pioneered by the economist Mohammed Yunus, who won a Nobel Peace Prize in 2006 for his founding role in establishing Grameen Bank. The pioneering bank, which has since inspired many others, provides very small loans or microcredit to the very poorest in rural Bangladesh, without requiring the usual collateral. The idea is that these loans empower people to set up businesses that will yield income, allowing them to pay off the debt and ultimately pull themselves out of poverty. Here's Jason's perspective on why he thinks microfinance specifically has been embraced so enthusiastically. And it's not about tackling poverty. Well, I think one of the reasons is that it, uh, it's, it provides such an elegant win-win solution. You know, I mean, people are attracted to it uh, because it, um, it holds out the possibility of um, keeping the global economic system basically as it is uh, and at the same time as maintaining the status quo. Um, helping people at the bottom of the pyramid uh, to improve their lives. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of like 
it's like revolution without the messiness of class struggle, right? What we really need is to challenge the distribution of power in the global economy. Um, and what microfinance allows us to do is make, make, it, make us feel like we're improving people's lives, feel like we're eradicating poverty, uh, eradicating poverty, when in fact we're not addressing the real causes of that in the first place. So, and if you, if you think about it, um, you know, th this has always been uh, key to the very idea of microfinance. So um, in Latin America, the U.S. Uh, government in, in the 60s and 70s was a major proponent of microfinance initiatives in Latin America. And, and they saw microfinance as a containment strategy. Their thought was, look, people are joining leftist movements in droves. They're, they're challenging um, the fact that land ownership is so concentrated among a few rich families. Uh, they're pushing against, uh, you know, U U.S. corporates' um, uh, control over their economies, um, et cetera. And uh, they're seeing poverty as a political problem, and they're, they're seeking out political solutions to it. And so they saw microfinance as a containment strategy to push against that tendency to, to try to convince, you know, peasants and workers that uh, all they really need is access to credits, uh, and the gumption to bootstrap themselves out of poverty themselves. And so they, they transformed the question of poverty and inequality from a political question into, uh, into a very personal and even moral one, uh, pulling the, uh, the, the wind out of the sails of, of, of progressive or left-wing political, uh, political movements, which were a threat to U.S. economic power over the region. So I think we have to recognize that history, which is still basically at play today. Aside from microfinance, I wanted to understand whether there could be any downsides to other types of social enterprise. And if so, what this might mean for the potential effectiveness of this approach. Stefan Chambers has a word of advice for would-be social entrepreneurs. There needs to be a kind of fundamental modesty in social entrepreneurship that may not always apply in commercial entrepreneurship, where the worst that happens is that you burn through your investors' capital and you close up shop and, and, and nobody dies. Okay? If you're doing this where people's real lives and livelihoods and uh, identities are wrapped up in this in more than trivial ways, in other words, it's not that they can't get their favorite phone ever again, it's that something bad happens in their real lives, then you have a different order of, of relationship with that person. Julie Wang studied a social enterprise in Bangladesh for her PhD thesis and found that despite its good intentions, there were some unintended consequences for its participants. She explains what the organisation set out to do. She refers to it here and in her research by the pseudonym the I Agent Scheme. So what this enterprise does is it trains young women from very poor families in rural areas of Bangladesh um, to use um, internet-enabled laptops and digital medical equipment and mobile phones and uh, multimedia software um, to show educational content on their laptops about family planning or agricultural techniques or labor rights or um, services that people can access from the state but don't know how to, um, health and hygiene issues. And so these women travel around by bicycle from village to village often on very tough terrain. In the monsoons, the dirt paths get completely muddy uh, and their tires sink several inches into the mud, uh, but they have to somehow get to the next, next village anyway to provide these services and then earn an income for themselves and their families. So the, the objective of the enterprise is to help rural villagers and, and use a distributional model that empowers women and gives them a chance to work outside the home. In terms of the effectiveness of this kind of approach, what did your research find? I found that this type of, of, of approach can be very effective for some people. There are remarkable best case practices that the social enterprise uh, are, is able to show. So one woman, for instance, um, became so popular among um, her fellow villagers and in several villages around her that people re started requesting her to run for local election and said that they'd vote for her regardless of you know what her plans would be that they just trusted her so much and she'd looked after them in many different ways um, by, by providing them health services or connecting them to state services um, and, and many other kinds of facilities um, but for the majority of the people who participate in this it's a a very grueling process and 
being an entrepreneur and especially traveling by bicycle for these young unmarried women is quite problematic socially. So they encounter a lot of stigma and challenges from their family members and people living around them. So it's, a, it's an uphill battle for the most part. You followed a couple of individual I agents. What were some of their experiences of the scheme? So um, when I first arrived in Bangladesh, I went to a location of the social enterprise that was the fully market model social enterprise after it had transitioned away from being an NGO and providing goods and services for free. And this was a group of 10 young women in this location. Eight of them were unmarried. And I lived with one of them for six months. And she struggled every day. She had to take out a loan for uh, around uh, 700 pounds just to get started, just to receive the training and purchase all the equipment that she would need, um, the, the mobile phones, the laptops, the, the bicycle. And so even if she would earn a little bit of money, all of that went straight back into repaying the loan to the National Bank um, and couldn't be used to justify to her parents and her broader um, members of her village that this was a worthwhile activity for her to be doing. To them, it seemed like she had just increased the debt that the family was in, rather than doing anything useful. And so she struggled with pressures at home financially. Um, at one point, uh, and, and this is this was the case for all the the other nine women in that location as well, uh, who were in debt so much at a certain point and not able to earn enough money that a few were being beaten up by their fathers. A couple were. Um, planning to flee to garments work in Dhaka, in the capital city. Um, one was just sure that she would be imprisoned, and so she was just hiding out in her home. And uh, one of them threatened suicide. So it's tremendously stressful, um, not just about the failure of their own businesses, but the, all the social pressure on top of that. These women had borrowed money from a commercial bank to join the I agent scheme and had fallen into a spiral of debt. But burdening poor people with debt is also an accusation that Jason Hickel levels at microcredit organisations, which were conceived to help people out of poverty, not entrench them in it. A study after study has come out, um, even aggregate studies, one funded by DFID a couple of years ago, that looked at all the available evidence and found that the, uh, the best estimate um, of the impact of microfinance on reducing poverty is, is basically zero. So the microfinance craze is built, on fun is built on foundations of sand. But, you know, there's that classic saying, isn't there, about, you know, give a man, give a man a fish, you know, or teach him how to fish. Is it, isn't the beauty of some of these projects like microfinance or some of the other social enterprises that you encourage personal empowerment and this idea of kind of like, building your way out of poverty. Isn't that an important idea in itself? I mean, I think that's I think that's absolutely important. Um, the problem is, again, that there's no evidence to suggest that this particular approach works. And I think that's the most important point we have to come back to. Um, so what happens when, when individuals are given these, um, these loans? Um, we know that in lots of cases, uh, they end up spending that money uh, to, to finance their own consumption, right? So these are very poor people. They're having trouble getting enough money to buy you know, food for their family or to send their children to school or to get medicines that they need. So when they get a microfinance loan, instead of building a business, what they end up doing is, is, uh, is just buying the things they need to survive. So as a result, because there's no business that's actually generating profit to pay back the loan, then they end up having, uh, having all of this debt that they, they can't effectively pay back. They have to take out new loans in order to finance the old loans wrapping themselves in layers of debt that's completely unsustainable. So in that sense, quite often, it, it generates more poverty than it, than it could possibly solve. So in South Africa, for example, uh, something like 94% of all um, microfinance money gets, gets spent on consumption. And so that's, uh, it's, you know, it, it's not solving the basic problem, which is that people don't have enough cash in their pockets in the first place to survive, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a systemic problem we have to look at. And so, you know, lo and behold, what all these studies are realizing is that the reason microfinance is not, is not working to eradicate poverty in poor countries is because uh, poor people just don't have enough money, <laughs> right? Christian Bush agrees that not all microfinance may be good, but for him, this does not invalidate the model of social entrepreneurship. I am not sure it's fair to look at an industry like microfinance and say, this is an example for 
right or wrong. Because at the end of the day, microfinance is an interesting example of, you know, in the social entrepreneurial context, because it is something where we've seen business models emerge, like the Grameen Bank, that have been lauded as best practice. And then we've had, we've seen kind of shark models emerge that have been lauded as worst practice that of course are absolutely not social entrepreneurial, but were essentially inspired by the social entrepreneurial model that showed that you can make a lot of money in these contexts. So at the end of the day, what's really interesting to me is to say, okay, if we take a market like Ori, a context like microfinance, what are the approaches that seem to work versus what are the approaches that don't seem to work? Given the debates around social enterprises, what role can market-driven development play in ending poverty? For Jason Hickel, the hype around social entrepreneurship is a distraction from what really needs to happen. In his book, The Divide, A Brief Guide to Global Inequality and Its Solutions, he highlights how in the 50s, 60s and 70s, countries across the global south were successfully tackling poverty with progressive policies. These included land reform, increasing wages for workers, rolling out social services like public health care and education, and nationalising natural resources. They were also making use of subsidies to assist young industries and tariffs to protect them from being undercut by Western imports. And it was working. It was a kind of development miracle. But then the third world debt crisis struck. Basically, as a result of rising oil prices, third world countries went into a tremendous amount of debt. And then in 1980, the US government jacked up interest rates on, uh, on, on the US dollar. And, uh, and as a result, they were not able to repay their debts, which were denominated in dollars. They slid to the brink of default. Uh, Wall Street cried out, wait a second, if you guys all default, then uh, the international financial system is going to collapse. They demanded that the US government bail them out, which it did by imposing structural adjustment conditions across the global south through the IMF that basically forced them to uh, impose austerity, to cut social spending, to liberalize their markets, to privatize uh, public goods, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so this restored Western access to Global South markets and resources and labor, drove the cost of labor down um, and had a devastating effect on Global South countries pretty much across the board. Uh, we saw um, income growth rates collapse um, across Africa, where, which was worst hit by structural adjustments. Incomes actually declined during the 80s and 90s. We saw poverty increase across the Global South. I mean, if you're looking for the greatest single cause of poverty, uh, in the 20th century, aside from colonialism? The answer is structural adjustment. And this is, this is perpetuated by the World Bank and the IMF, which were basically tools of uh, US economic imperial policy, controlled by a US veto. The vast majority of the voting power is controlled by a, a very small handful of Western economic uh, um, powers. And uh, the Global South, which has 80, 85% of the population, has less than 50% of the vote in these institutions. So that's how skewed uh, the, you know, um, the power in the global economic system is distributed. So, you know, to talk about microfinance as a solution just misses all of that history. It misses all of the history. It misses all of that power. So it's, it's dehistoricizing and depoliticizing. And, uh, and in that sense, it's profoundly anti-intellectual. We need to have a broader systems view about these problems. And uh, we need solutions that target the actual issues. Julie Wong warns of an over-reliance on the market to solve all problems. I think that if if entrepreneurs would pay as much attention to social due diligence as they do to financial due diligence, if they spend as much time working on their social model as much as they do on their business model, then that would help a great deal, uh, even just to troubleshoot and understand what is the set of social problems that they're actually trying to address, and it, is it really what they think it is, and is their solution really actually valued and useful to people who would be taking them up. Um, but then also, again, to recognize that market models are not going to solve social and political problems. So they should not get too ahead of themselves in the kinds of impact claims that they'll be having. Stefan Chambers has an encouraging word for students interested in becoming social entrepreneurs. Anyone peddling silver bullets is probably wrong. So... Is social entrepreneurship a vital, important, likely to grow um, uh, um, element of a set of answers to questions about social justice, the mitigation of existential risk? Clearly, absolutely, yes. Is it the, is it the, the whole answer to anything? Clearly, no. But we should enthuse 
um, we, we should support enthusiastic students who, who want to have a positive effect on the world. Um, in part because that's what the world needs. It needs, you know, it's, it, is one of the, it is one of the great renewable resources, people's, um, people's social, intellectual, cultural capital. And we have the, the science and the technology to allow people to get all kinds of extraordinary things done now. And we should in particular support our students in getting those things done because the risk to them at this stage in their lives of trying something and failing is close to zero. Is social entrepreneurship the answer to world poverty? Clearly not. It was always an unfair question. There are bigger structural issues at play which need to be addressed if we're really going to end global poverty. And poor people are not poor because they fail to be entrepreneurial enough. However, Many argue that the best designed social enterprises can provide innovative micro-solutions that offer the possibility of being scaled up and of improving people's lives on a wider scale. Tell us what you think using the hashtag LSEIQ. This episode of LSEIQ was brought to you by James Ratti, Tom Williams, Shay Forbes-Taylor and Sue Windybank. It was based in part on the following research. Five Steps to Scaling Social Impact in the Journal of Management with Impact and Substantiating Social Entrepreneurship Research in the International Journal of Entrepreneurial Venturing, both by Christian Bush. The Divide, A Brief Guide to Global Inequality and Its Solutions by Jason Hickel. The Ambiguous Figures of Social Enterprise, Gendered Flexibility and Relational Work Among the I Agents of Bangladesh by Julia Kermezi Huang forthcoming in the November 2017 issue of American Ethnologist. Find out more about the Marshall Institute for Philanthropy and Social Entrepreneurship at lse.ac.uk forward slash Marshall hyphen Institute. And you can read about our labs at rlabs.org. For more episodes of this podcast and to subscribe on iTunes and SoundCloud, please visit lse.ac.uk forward slash IQ or search for LSE IQ in your favourite podcast app. See you next time when we ask, is our prison system broken?